All right, thank you for joining us today. First off, before we begin, I'd like to thank the Mineral Deposits Division of the Geological Association of Canada for their support of this webinar, as well as for supporting our special volume. That volume would not have been possible had it not been for the amazing efforts of Louise Corvo to keep us all organized on track and on time. So thank you very much, Louise. Today, I'd like to talk about uranium enrichment in metasomatic iron and alkali calcic alteration systems, and specifically, I'd like to link some field observations to what to trace element, element concentrations. So why study these systems? Well, we know there are currently three IOC deposits defined in Canada, two in the Great Bear Magmatic Zone and one in the Grenville Province in Quebec. Also, from a uranium ore systems perspective, Olympic Dam does hold the world's largest uranium resource that's being developed. And really, we're just starting to understand uranium enrichment in ICG's deposits, as well as the broader MIAC systems. And importantly, Olympic Dam is not the only MIAC system or IOC deposit with elevated uranium contents. There's numerous examples globally, including some in Canada, such as the Sudayan, Fab Lake, Southern Bridge, et cetera, which I'm going to discuss today. This project area project was based in the Great Bear Magmatic Zone, working with Luis Corvo as part of our Geomapping for Energy Minerals program project. The Great Bear Magmatic Zone is a Paleoproterozoic uh, continental arc formed over an older Paleoproterozoic arc called the Hoda Train, shown here in brown, and an upper sedimentary basin at the margin of uh, Archaeon Craton. Magmatism occurred during the transition between compression and extension and occurs in two stages. Main stage is from 1878 to 1860, whereas a later stage, a type A, A type granitic plutons, occurred from 1858 to 1850 MA. Why look in the Great Bear Zone? Well, the excellent exposure from the topography and sparse vegetation really allows us to see the full extent of these systems from the deep roots to the shallow near surface expressions. And for example, if you look at the, the spectrum of deposits included in the zone, we have right from the bottom. Iron oxide apatite deposits, lead zinc scarns, albatite hosted uranium, IOCG variants such as the Nico deposit, bona fide IOCG deposits going from the magnetite to hematite groups, as well as the final epithermal caps and quartz main systems that we find in the shallow or distal zones of these systems. For this study, we focused on three deposit types magnetite hematite deposits, IOA to magnetite IOCG deposits albatite hosted uranium, as well as low temperature remobilization into late quartz veins, hematite line fractures, and polymetallic veins, just for comparison between the two chemical signatures. Some of you may be wondering why we have albatite hosted uranium in here, and hopefully today I'll present some data and observations that'll show you why we've included it in this MIAC system in the evolution. First off, I'll be talking about the magnetite hematite deposits, such as the Sudayan deposit, which is a structural hydrothermal breccia containing disseminated calcopyrite, boronite, and rare calcocyte, integral and replacing iron oxides. Uranium mineralization occurs in veinlets, marginals of the copper rich zones, as fractures or tiny fracture coatings and, and veinlets. You see in the Apollo section here on box number three, these bright white zones, those are the uranium mineralization or, and fractures. In thin sections, it's confirmed what we see in, in hand sample that's fine grain, and porous, and altered uranium minerals. Um, they occur in late fractures and veinlets that cross cut all the MIAC alteration. And unfortunately, the, the minerals are too altered and too fine grained for analysis. If you look at different other examples, such as the damp and boat occurrences, shown here in the pictures, we see these bright red albatite class set in a magnetite and hematite matrix. So just similar observations. We have some re reduced uranium minerals, but the majority are oxidized uranium bearing minerals. Uh, that occur in the hematite rich matrix and occur along fractures, which all this suggests that they're not primary mineralization shown here in the thin section. You can see they're very fine grained and highly altered minerals. Next, if we look at magnetite, magnetite group ICG deposits, such as the Fab and Nori showings, um, we see these are magnetite with potassium iron alteration. These have been overprinted by a weak hematite bearing potassium iron alteration. The uranium. In these occurrences, it's shown say with magnetite and cave feldspar plus or minus biotite mainlands and alteration. But those mineral systems have gone through the full spectrum of alteration from sodic alteration, high temperature calcite iron alteration. And in some cases at FAB, we do get some weak hematite varying potassium iron alteration. In thin section, we can confirm what we see in hand cycles that the uranium minerals are all associated with cave feldspar and magnetite, 
but that the minerals are coarser grain that we saw previously and they're pretty well preserved. There is some minor alteration of uranium tocophenite, but these assemblages are pretty consistent in that uranium is associated with these k part by type and, and magnetite alteration. Next, if we look at albatite hosted uranium, such as the Southern Breccia Corridor, which is a three kilometer long fault boundary albatite corridor just located one kilometer south of the Nico deposit. That location, as well as age constraints that we're able to determine from mapping, show that both systems formed within a five million year window. Um, so they're really part of the same metastatic mineral system. These were discoveries of application of the OR system model. Um, specifically, Louise in her previous studies had always noted that the sodic alteration was missing from the NICO deposit. The NICO deposit has intense calcic iron alteration, some potassic iron alteration, as well as some low temperature potassic iron alteration. So it was only through persistence and application of that more model that we were able to finally find this the sodic alteration corridor. If we look at some field pictures of the sodic alteration, starting on the left, moving to the right, it is progressively uh, progressive generations of albatization becoming starting from a cream white and getting pink colored, following fractures and also stratomount alteration. However, what's, what's unique with the Southern Breccia is that albatization is overprinted by a high temperature potassic iron alteration, it's veins and breccias that transitions into hematite bearing alteration and finally hematite uh, veinlets. On the right, you can see this is a CT scan where you have this. Albatization, highly porous, coming in, breccating, replacing the metasil stone. You see some relic beds preserved here. The bright white, white colors are the more dense minerals, such as the iron oxide and uranium minerals. If you look at the chemistry, whole rock dew chemistry, using principal carbon analysis, we can see that the deposits are very distinct. The southern breccia is enriched in uranium, thorium, uh, sodium, naive, and tantalum shown here in the bright and the red dots to the plot to the left of the, in the plot. Whereas the NICO is enriched in the base metals, cobalt, uh, nickel, as, as well as manganese, but also have the calcic iron, calcic iron and magnesium diagnostic of the alteration. Southern breccia, uh, from, the, from the field observations, geochemistry lacks an intense calcium iron alteration that we see everywhere in the NICO deposit. Also, if we look along the fault and northern margin of the corridor, we can see some subtle transitions between the southern breccia and the Nico deposit. Uh, shown here on the, on the bottom right-hand corner, you can see the bright red albatized corridor, albatized beds are being cross-cut and, and overprinted by high temperature calcium iron, iron alteration that contains a cobaltite and arsenopyrite, diagnostic of what we see in the Nico deposit. In thin section, confirm what we see in the outcrop that albatization really predates the mineralization. Uh, Showing the audio radiograph here up in the top of right, you can see all the uranium minerals are associated with these late uh, magnetite and K feldspar bearing veinlets and breccia zones, where some of the later alterations, such as hematite veinlets here and breccias, are, are, don't contain any uranium minerals. That porosity during albatization is really critical for weakening the rock. Uh, which allows brecciation and focusing of fluids for later mineralization. In thin section, we can see uranium is hosted in these K feldspar biotite magnetite veins, plus or minus some sulfides such as calcopyrite, pyrite, boronite, etc. We do see some uh, enrichment in zircon as well as uh, some co precipitated thorite. So what's a working model for this, this appetite hosted occurrence? Well, we have differential examination. So that we have at depth, the sodic alteration and the regional sodic alteration, which form the albatite, the Southern Breccia albatite corridor. Prior to the onset of calcium iron alteration, we had differential examination. So the Southern Breccia corridor was thrust to shallower depths where the high temperature potassic iron alteration was occurring. Uh, and then finally, both of them were printed, overprinted by low temperature potassic iron alteration. This model is consistent with what we see in the, the chemistry, the, uh, the mag, the plutons and the batholiths for change from extensional, from compression to extensional regime. And that occurred during the brittle ductile, to, duct, to, sorry, the brittle conditions, under brittle conditions. Next, just want to, for comparison, look at the low temperature remobilization of uranium. Uh, we find it in late hematite chloride, quickie falls for quartz valence, for example, cutting the southern breccia zone, shown on the bottom left here, the earthy red uh, hematite veinlets. 
as well, we see it in high-grade polymetallic veins in the Port Rain area, which has historically been fallen under the five element veins. However, proposing more recent works has shown that the, due to the proximity of the Hornby Bay Basin, shown just up here out of the, of the view, and age constraints from cross-cutting Mayfi decks, as well as the rare filament patterns in uranonite, that these are probably more akin to unconforming related deposits like we see in the Athabasca Basin. And perhaps a working model is that you have mobilization of the metals in the basement from older Maya deposits into these um, younger vein systems by the basinal fluids. If you look at the chemistry now of the uranonite, start with the major to minor elements, we start to see clear differences between what we're considering primary and secondary uranium mineralization. The primary has moderate to high thorium contents, almost up to 13% uh, from the southern breccia, as well as higher lead contents. And that's what was shown in the plots here as SB1, coal, fab, nori1, or DeVries. Secondary or lower temperature uranium event or more mobilization, you typically have lower thorium contents, lead, and yttrium, but are as well coupled with higher uranium, calcium, and iron content. And we see that in the SB2 and NORI2 plots. If you look at trace elements, specifically the chondrite normalized rare earth element patterns of uraninite, we see that most of the occurrence is high rare earth element contents, and but the patterns tend to be flat with strongly negative europium anomalies, similar to what we'd expect for magmatic or igneous hosted uraninite shown here in the gray pattern, gray area, excuse me. Uh, some of the occurrences do have mild light wear element depletion. Uh, for example, down at the Nori and DeVries occurrences, but we can ascribe that to co precipitation of light wear earth element bearing alanite. We are starting to see, just as so we see the major chemistry, major and minor element chemistry, differences between primary and secondary mineralization. Uh, take, for example, at the Southern Breccia, the primary mineralization shown here in the black line, whereas the secondary mineralization in the hematite veins are shown in blue. There is a difference, however, between the secondary event and then what we're perhaps calling the call as dissolution precipitation reactions of the uraninite. Shown here from Nori, we see the primary mineralization shown in black, whereas we have a secondary event um, delineated by the major element chemistry uh, shown in blue. But interestingly enough, the rare earth element patterns stay pretty much the same, just a slight increase in the light rare earth element concentrations. If you look at the total rare earth element concentrations and we'll get uranium thorium ratios, a similar uh, observation. The southern breccia, the secondary SB2, plots down this low temperature hydrothermal field, whereas the primary mineralization, as well as the dissolution reprecipitation uh, uraninite, plots into the high temperature to magmatic fields. So, how does this compare? Can we look abroad? Unfortunately, there's not a whole lot of data available from ICG's. Uh, deposits globally, but we can use other sources of information. For example, looking at uranium isotopes. If you look at the uranium isotopic composition of uh, uraninite and whole rock or ore concentrates, we can see that at Olympic Dam, shown here in the bottom left, uh, the uranium isotopes suggest that you had uh, leaching of uranium from the upper continental crust from granitoid volcanic rocks, and you had transportation and precipitation under high temperature conditions. However, it is important to note that our discrepancies between uraninite and ore concentrate analyses. However, when you couple that with what we see decoupling between uranium and lead within the Olympic Dam deposit, shown here on the right, um, there is a strong evidence that you've got intense remobilization of uranium in Olympic Dam. So how does this all come together? Well, I think we're pretty consist uh, consistently shown that in the magnetic dominated systems of the group of magmatic zone, Uranium was precipitated from high temperature reducing fluids rather than oxidized brine that has been previously proposed. And the support for this is from the elevated and rare earth element and thorium contents in uraninite, as well as the presence of cogenetic thorium in these mainland systems, main systems. Um, also, we see the flat rare earth element patterns in uraninite, which is diagnosed with high temperature precipitation. And just for example, if we look at the temperatures that were recorded in these alteration assemblages. For the sodic and transitional sodic calcic iron alteration, we're talking greater than 600 degrees to 450 degrees Celsius. In the high temperature potassium iron assemblages, we're talking 500 to 350 degrees Celsius. Uranium was likely transported by chlorine-rich fluids with precipitation triggered by cooling and or changes in fluid chemistry induced by the extensive fluid rock interactions. And we have support from this by looking at the composition of these intrusions, Sinor intrusions, which are shoshinitic to high K calcalkaline composition, 
And that composition is conducive to exsolution of chlorine-rich fluids. Also, there's been recent experimental work by Timo Vive et al. in 2018, which documented the presence of a new uranium chloride species that's just highly mobile under high temperature reduced conditions. And that precipitation would, uh, would occur when you have cooling or changes in pH. And that chlorine-rich fluid also aligns with the, with the high rare element concentrations that we're seeing in the uranium. If we go into a bit of a further detail, we can actually start to see the difference between primary and secondary, as well as localized solution reprecipitation uh, uraninite. From the primary and the localized dissolution reprecipitation mineralization, we see they have similar rare earth element patterns, but can differ in major element and minor element compositions. The later temperature event, however, is completely distinct in both the minor and trace element compositions. And we're proposing that perhaps that we're starting to see that same story on Big Dam or in the Gala Craton. For example, if you look at uranium isotopes on Big Dam, there's evidence to support that there were high temperature processes involved in uranium precipitation. I should clarify that's primary uranium precipitation because Macmillan and Al in 2016 reported there was at least four generations of uraninite, reflecting primary plus multiple stages of dissolution and reprecipitation. Also, as shown by Lees in the special volume, we do have decoupling of uranium from lead within the Olympic Dam deposit. And Fabris, and also the special volume, has also shown that uranium enrichment and magnetite dominated occurrences are commonly similar or greater in magnitude than what we've reported in hematite dominated occurrences, which is again reinforcing that primary uranium enrichment is likely occurring during the magnetite dominant alteration. So in conclusion, what we're seeing is there's probably multiple generations of uranium mineralization in these systems. We have a primary precipitation, then followed by dissolution reprecipitation reactions as the hydrothermal cells collapse. And then finally, we're having a later remobilization uh, through meteoric, wa meteoric water or basal brine interaction with the ores. Thank you for your time. And I look forward to answering any questions in the session following the talks. Thank you.